Welcome to lecture 27, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. There's going to be a mantra that you're going to have to remember. A matrix times a vector equals a number times a vector. We're going to hear that over and over again in this lecture. This lecture is also going to be a bit long. There's a lot of material. Eigenvalues and eigenvectors are one of the most important applications of linear algebra into physics. It's definitely an area that you need to know and you need to know it well. So please pay attention to this lecture and work hard on the problems that you're going to be doing that are related to this work. Eigenvalues and eigenvectors, what do we mean by that? We're going to transform the matrix to a basis such that when the matrix multiplies a basis vector, it's going to produce a number times the original basis vector. And then we have, in other words, the sum of the matrix Mij times E hat J, which is the basis vector, summed over J, will equal lambda times e hat i, because that's going to be the ith component of the target vector, or the final vector, after I've done this transformation. The fact that it is equal to a number lambda that doesn't depend on i, and is multiplying by the initial, the original vector e hat, that's what tells us that we have a eigenvalue and an eigenvector relationship. Now, if the matrix is an n by n matrix, then there will be n such basis vectors, and we're going to denote them with a superscript i. So m times the ith basis vector matrix e hat i will equal lambda i e hat i. Note that this i does not mean the coordinate of the vector. There are n different vectors. There's an e1 vector, there's an e2 vector, an e3 vector. And there are n different eigenvalues. There's a lambda 1, a lambda 2, etc. This is not, it's always one number, lambda 17 times e hat 17 for all of the n components of e hat 17. Okay, be sure that you understand that. Very critical point. Now, this is one of the most difficult things that I have found for students to understand, and so we're going to repeat it a few times until you start getting sick of it. So, a matrix times a vector equals a number times a vector. What was that you said? A matrix times a vector equals a number times a vector. Oh, you didn't quite get it yet? A matrix times a vector is equal to a number times a vector. Huh? A matrix times a vector equals a number times a vector. Please remember that. Really important. So, how do we find such solutions? Note that the matrix times a vector equals a number times a vector implies that M minus the number lambda times the unit matrix, that whole thing acting on the vector E is equal to zero. I get that simply by subtracting the right hand side from the left hand side and no, noticing that i times e hat is the same as e hat. Okay, that's all that it takes. But now remember, now let's go back to row reduction. When we had a problem where we had a vector times a matrix was equal to zero, we got a non trivial solution only when the determinant of the matrix was equal to zero. So we have to have the determinant of m minus lambda i equals zero. Otherwise, we don't have a valid non-trivial solution. Now, if you work out that determinant as a function of lambda, you'll find it's an n-dimensional polynomial in lambda. And an n-dimensional polynomial in lambda will have n solutions in a complex vector space. In a real vector space, when we're only looking for real solutions, there may be less than n solutions. You know this from quadratic equations. Sometimes with quadratic equations, you get complex roots. Well, if I'm looking for only the real roots, then I might have no roots to my quadratic equation. What are some facts about this? If the matrix M is real and symmetric, then there are n real solutions. I'm going to just take this as a fact. You can work pretty hard in a linear algebra course to prove this fact, but we're going to just take this as given. The second thing, there might be multiple roots where lambda i is equal to lambda j for some i and some j. When this happens, we say we have degeneracy. Oftentimes, degeneracy is related to the fact that there's some extra symmetry in the problem. 
we're going to find the eigenvector once we found the eigenvalue by solving the equation m times e equals lambda times e or if you like m minus lambda times i acting on e is equal to zero that's the equation we're going to solve to determine the eigenvector e if the matrix M is Hermitian, which means M is equal to M dagger, remember the dagger is a transpose and a complex conjugation, then there are N eigenvalues and all those eigenvalues are real. In particular, a real symmetric matrix is Hermitian. We're next going to look at some examples to help you understand exactly how this works. So we're going to start with a two by two example. The matrix we're going to work with is real and symmetric. It's given by 10, 6, 6, minus 10. And so to find the eigenvalues, we have to solve the determinant of m minus lambda i is equal to 0. So I subtract lambda from the diagonal. Take the determinant. I'm going to get 10 minus lambda times minus 10 minus lambda minus 36. That becomes lambda squared minus 136 is equal to 0. Or lambda is plus or minus the square root of 36, which can be factorized. It's plus or minus 2 square root of 34. All right, we've got our eigen values we now find the eigenvectors i'm going to first look at the eigenvector with the positive eigenvalue i take my matrix i subtract lambda so i get 10 minus 2 root 34 and minus 10 minus 2 root 34 i'm on the diagonal i'm going to multiply that by the eigenvector which i'm just going to call a and b a for the first component b for the second component and i set that whole thing equal to zero so this is what typically happens. We only have to work with n minus 1 equations. So I can always multiply this by an overall scale and nothing changes. So what we're going to find, we're going to just look at the top equation. 10 minus 2 times the square root of 34 times a plus 6 times b is equal to 0. I can solve that a is equal to minus 6b over 10 minus 2 root 34. Or I can solve it for b. b would equal minus 10 minus 2 root 34 a divided by 6 then what we do is we normalize it. So the normalization is a squared plus b squared, which we want equal to 1. So I'm going to work with a as my overall scale factor. Then I'm going to get a squared times 1 plus 1 over 6 times 10 minus 2 root 34 quantity squared. That whole thing has to equal 1. Now I can expand that, and what I find is, when I do the final solution, is a is equal to 3 over the square root of 68 minus 10 root 34 important that you go through this algebra. It's just algebra. It's just arithmetic. Just be careful. Go through it slowly. There's really not any tricks to it. You just have to work out all the different terms. That's all. And then we plug into the relationship between a and b, and we find b is equal to minus uh, the numerator of 5 minus root 34 over the square root of 68 minus 10 root 34. So we've gotten our first eigenvector. Now it turns out for the other eigenvector, if you look carefully at the way in which we did the solution, all that's going to happen is we're going to change the sign of the square root, the thing that has the square root of 34. We just change the sign of that and we'll get the other eigenvector. So E1 is equal to 3 and minus 5 plus root 34 divided by 1 over the square root of 68 minus 10 root 34. And E2 will equal 3 minus 5 minus root 34 over 1 divided by the square root of 68 plus 10 root 34. And you should immediately verify that e1 dot e2 is equal to 0. We already know that e1 squared and e2 squared are equal to 1, because that's how we constructed them. But you should really verify that e1 dot e2 is equal to 0 to make sure you understand that these eigenvectors that come out will be a orthonormal basis set for the vector that we're working with. Okay, let's go on to example 2. For example, two, we're going to be looking at a 3 by 3 matrix. It's also real and symmetric, and it's given by 1, 0, 2, 0, 0, minus 1, 2, minus 1, minus 1. So to get the eigenvalues, we have to subtract lambda off the diagonal and take the determinant of that and set it equal to 0. And so now we have to work out, there's a number of terms to work out. You should carefully work this out, and you should verify that when all the dust settles, you find lambda cubed, minus 6 lambda plus 1 is equal to 0. That's the equation that these eigenvalues are going to satisfy. It turns out that's not that easy to solve. Now, in principle, there is a analytic formula for the cube root of any equation, but if you've ever actually worked them out, in many cases that analytic formula is a real pain to work with. 
So what we would typically do is we take this, we put it on a computer to solve. So we find a uh, root solver that will give us the different values of lambda, and then we'll plug into the matrix, and we will do effectively the row reduction to get the eigenvectors, because trying to do this algebra by hand gets too torturous to get through rather quickly. And this is part of the reason why you don't get a lot of examples about how to solve eigenvalues and eigenvectors, because anything beyond that two-by-two two problem that we were just talking about turns out to really take a fair amount of time to solve. And unless there's some symmetry that factorizes this polynomial, you end up having a situation where the calculations are kind of tough to, to get through. All right, so we've talked about different bases for matrices and how we transform from one basis to another. Let's now look at this matrix and its eigenbases. So the eigenvectors E1 to En, they're an orthonormal set. So I can use that orthonormal set as a basis for the matrix. What does the matrix look like in that basis? Well, to get the matrix in this basis, we have to first form P and P inverse. We form those from the vectors E1 to En in the following way that's shown schematically for you on the left. And then we have to do the similarity transformation on the matrix. And when we do the similarity transformation, we find the matrix ends up being diagonal with the eigenvalues along the diagonal. Really, really important that you take the time to work this out and make sure that you understand exactly how this happens. You have to take into account the fact that ei.ej is equal to delta ij. That's a critical element to helping you get this. You also have to work out the fact that m times e equals lambda times e. So m times the ith eigenvector will equal lambda i times the ith eigenvector. That is also a property you need to get it into this final form. But those are the only two properties you need, and you should carefully work that out. All right, this now is going to allow us to do some interesting things with matrices, which I'm going to go over for you in the remaining part of this lecture. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take the exponential of a matrix. That sounds like a crazy thing at first. An exponential, how in the world do I take an exponential of a matrix? Well, we just go to the power series expansion. So let's assume we have an m by m matrix m, and we're going to look at the power series expansion of e to the m. So I just do the Taylor series, the sum n equals 0 to infinity, 1 over n factorial, m raised to the nth power. I can multiply matrices by themselves. The product is a matrix. So now what happens, though, is if we do a similarity transformation and we write m in terms of its eigenbasis, then m is equal to p inverse times that diagonal matrix times p, as shown here. And I'm going to raise that to the nth power. Now when I raise that to the nth power, just like what we were doing when we were looking at similarity transformations, you'll find in the interior of all of these products, we're going to get a p times a p inverse. And a p times a p inverse is equal to the identity, and an identity times a matrix is just equal to the matrix. And so what we end up getting is I can factor off one factor of p inverse to the left, one factor of p to the right, and I just get that diagonal matrix now raised to the nth power. Now a diagonal matrix raised to the nth power, that's easy to work out. It's just the diagonal raised to the nth power. So I get a lambda 1 to the n, lambda 2 to the n, etc., all the way out to lambda m to the n all sandwiched between the p inverse and the p, but now this power series I can evaluate. So I can rewrite it, say the first element will be the sum n equals 0 to infinity, 1 over n factorial, lambda 1 to the n. Well, that's just equal to e to the lambda, lambda 1. Similarly for lambda 2, it'll be e to the lambda 2, all the way down to e to the lambda m. So you see by diagonalizing the matrix, we're able to actually explicitly calculate that exponential and now I have to do this inverse similarity transformation and I will get what the exponential of this matrix is. So rather than trying to imagine doing this infinite power series which would be a real pain with matrices, using this trick of going to the diagonal basis and then applying the exponential and then doing the inverse of the diagonal basis, that allows us to calculate the exponential of the matrix and generalize the concept of an exponential to a matrix, which once again, this turns out to be an incredibly important result in physics when you start talking about things like 
time evolution of quantum mechanical systems. You're going to have to be dealing with these kinds of things, and you'll be dealing with some slightly more complicated versions of this as well. Note, and this is a mistake that many novices make, the exponential of a matrix is not the exponential of each element in the matrix. I don't actually know what it is, because it's a complicated mixture. Once I multiply by the P inverse on the, on the left and the P on the right, but I can guarantee you it is not going to be the exponential of each of the matrix elements of the original matrix. Do not make this mistake. That's a rookie mistake. You can only take the exponential where it will be the exponential of each element of the matrix. That will only work for the diagonal elements when the matrix is in a diagonal form. That's the only time it works. It doesn't even work for the off-diagonal elements because the exponential of 0 would be 1. But the off-diagonal elements are actually all 0 and they remain 0. So you have to really be careful with this. The exponential or any function applied to an, a matrix, you can apply the function to the diagonal when it's in diagonal form. And that's the only situation where that will work. But that will work for different functions as well, as we're going to see in our next example. So the next example is the absolute value of a matrix. Wouldn't it be neat to look at the concept of the absolute value of a matrix? Note once again, not the absolute value of each of the matrix elements. That's not what the absolute value of a matrix is. We define the absolute value as this positive square root of m squared. And so I'm going to write this as p inverse times the diagonal matrix, which was lambda 1 all the way out to lambda m. I'm going to square it and take the square root. And that will equal the absolute value of lambda 1, absolute value of lambda 2, absolute value of lambda m. And then I multiply by p on the right. And once again, this is not the same as taking the absolute value of each of the matrix elements, but it is the definition of what the absolute value of a matrix is in a matrix sense. And this, once again, is an important thing that even many people who have taken linear algebra classes, even multiple linear algebra classes, for some reason they don't get taught this. But it's actually a very important concept. And once again, after the similarity transformation, I don't know what this matrix is going to look like or how it will compare to the original matrix. It'll definitely be different. It will likely have matrix elements that are negative. But all of its eigenvalues will be non-negative. So that's the thing that will happen when I have an absolute value of a matrix. Okay, that's all we have for matrices, eigenvalues, and eigenvectors. It's a lot of material. You might need to watch this video one more time to really get a handle of it. There's a lot of complicated material in here, but also really, really important stuff. You're going to find that this, these manipulations and these definitions are the kinds of things you're going to be dealing with again and again and again in physics classes.